My name is Somo. I'm a graduate student with Professor Justin Wabu in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. I'm a part of the Cooling Technology Research Center and today we'll take you through a brief tour of the Electronics Cooling Lab. So first we'll look at the, this room of the lab where we have the facility for testing out the heat pipes. So the heat pipes, these are like state-of-the-art devices which go into the uh, go as cooling solutions into the CPUs, also the you know, mobile phones. And what my lab mate Kalin is doing is that he's trying to do a transient study both from the models and from the experiments as you can see over here in the air cooled condition. So as we move from these heat pipes, we are now going to the next part of the lab where basically we are have an overclocking facility developed by my colleague Peyton. My name is Peyton Case and I'm the undergraduate head of the Purdue Overclocking Group. We are a collaboration between IEEE and the CTRC intended to research and develop novel cooling solutions for high performance computers and compete nationally against university teams to produce the fastest PCs possible. Currently, this facility focuses on characterizing the relationship between computer cooling capacity improvement and real-world performance enhancements. This characterization is achieved by measuring the heat transfer from the central processing unit of our test bench to our water cooling loop while running various benchmarks and stress tests. We can vary the heat transfer by manipulating the fan speed on our cooling loop and finally associate a trend between cooling capacity and real-world performance. The overclocking group plans to branch out into cryogenic cooling in the near future to push our test bench to its thermal limit. This experiment will use a reservoir of liquid nitrogen to bring the temperature of our computer below negative 80 degrees Celsius to significantly improve the benchmark performance. We hope to use this data to better understand the effects of sub-zero temperatures on consumer electronics as well as investigate potential use cases for cryogenic cooling facilities. Here is my colleague Sarvatsun who is working on the permeability of weak structures in vapor chambers. Shown on the left is a photograph of the facility. Uh, the facility is a uh, liquid flow loop that pumps liquid into a test section. The test section is uh, has been custom designed to hold a porous sample and pump liquid in plane to the porous sample as shown by the blue arrows here and uh, it also pumps air through plane to the porous sample. So uh, the idea is to measure a pressure drop across the sample when air flows through plane and liquid flows in plane, creating a two-phase flow mixture in the porous sample. And the relative permeability is uh, basically measured by measuring the pressure drops at different mass fluxes of liquid and vapor, and then calibrating the relative permeability to the 1D flow equation in a porous sample. So uh, that's it from me. Um, I thank you for your time and hope you have a good rest of the virtual tour. As we move across, we can see that here is my here's the work of my colleague Matt who works on boiling instabilities, effect of boiling instabilities on heat transfer coefficient for microchannel heat sinks. So the facility you're looking at is designed to investigate system level effects on flow boiling heat sinks and understand their impact on practical heat sink performance. In a real system, compressibility can appear in any of the flow loop components in the form of trapped air or flexible walls, for example. Uh, this compressibility dynamically interacts with the two-phase mixture in the heat sink and that results in instabilities. This facility is designed to isolate the test section from the rest of the system and then induce a controlled degree of compressibility. It does this using a buffer volume, which is the graduated cylinder you can see in this image. Um, by running experiments with and without a compressible volume, we're able to compare those results and then understand how instabilities caused by an upstream compressible volume affect heat transfer performance uh, in terms of heat transfer coefficient and critical heat flux in the heat sink. We now will be going towards the 3D printed heat sink design, designed by my colleague Sardar. I'm currently working on designing the geometry of these heat sinks. Uh, optimizing these shapes, these geometries that could extract the highest amount of heat has the best thermal performance. We were able to use additive manufacturing. Now we can design very, very complex geometries that could otherwise not be possible to manufacture using conventional methods. Additive manufacturing, I guess, brings us the ability to have custom, specialized, application-specific uh, design freedom that you can use to fabricate complex features. A new test section is being introduced to the additively manufactured heat sink facility. This new test section will be used to characterize fluid flow rather than heat sink performance 
in additively manufactured components. These tests will feature rectangular cross-section microchannels and investigate the effects of internal roughness resulting from the manufacturing process on the Nusselt number and friction factor. Hello everyone, I am Sahil Pai. I am a second year PhD student under Dr. Weibel and I am working on the project titled Machine Learning Assisted Design of High Performance Cold Plates. We know that liquid cooling provides better performance than air cooling for commercial range power densities. Therefore, it is important to carry out fundamental investigations into the design process and optimization of liquid cooled devices such as cold plates. In this project, we look forward to investigating and achieving the following three things. A. We are working on making a surrogate machine learning model for predicting the fluid flow and heat transfer properties for any flow configuration. B. Uh, once we have this model, we will be able to identify flow properties and find flow properties for geometries which haven't been documented yet. And C. Uh, we will use this model to improve the design optimization process by expanding the search domain and also by making the optimization process faster. To achieve the goals and objectives of the project, we have adopted the following approach. We have collected a lot of data pertaining to fluid flow properties and heat transfer properties for different flow configurations and we have used this, da used this data to train machine learning models which are currently being used to search for high performance cold plate surface designs. Here comes the pool boiling facilities. My colleague Nick, he is basically experimenting a lot of surfaces and basically testing out how boiling happens. So here, as you can see, is the boiling facility. I'm actually testing one of the samples of my research. Um, here, I'm taking simultaneous infrared thermography as well as high-speed camera footage of um, the bubble ablation cycle and the sample itself. See so here on the um, left here is the actual infrared um, imaging from the bottom of the sample while the right is actually the high-speed footage um, coming from the side. So what I'm doing is I'm studying the effects of dynamic wettability on boiling heat transfer. So by taking these two, um, take both infrared and the high-speed footage, we could get information about the mobilization cycle and the effects of the wettability on boiling heat transfer. Hello, my colleague Monod. It characterize individual surfaces for boiling conditions and to enhance the critical heat flux. Over the last decade, Many studies have explored the use of microstructuring for enhancing the critical heat flux. Essentially, what these surfaces do is that they wick the fluid underneath the bowel, allowing a liquid supply to the surface. This wicking essentially delays the critical heat flux. Here is a picture of boiling facility and we are highlighting over here the boiling chamber. During the experiment, the boiling chamber is sealed and maintained at a pressure higher than the atmosphere. The immersion heaters keep the fluid at the saturation temperature and the vapor generated during boiling is condensed back using the condenser. Microstructure surfaces are attached to the copper block and heated via cartridge heaters. The temperature of the surface at a particular heat flux is measured from linear interpolation of the thermocouples inserted inside the copper block. We measure the heat flux through the surface during the CHF. Another facility where we have a flow boiling loop and currently being worked on by Ryan where we can basically see that we have two loops going through and we have a micro channel in which basically we have a two phase boiling condition from a reservoir. My name is Ryan Regan. My future project will be focused on interwinding electric motor cooling in airplanes via two phase flow. Permanent magnet electric motors pictured on the left house their magnets in the rotor and the electromagnetic windings in the stator. These motors generate a majority of their heat through copper resistive losses in the windings, so cooling efforts must focus on this area. In order to reduce the thermal resistance between coolant and heat generation as much as possible, my facility will flow coolant through the windings. This technique is called interwinding cooling, and an example schematic of this method can be seen on the right. Previous interwinding research has only operated with single phase flow, but mine will utilize two phase. Airplanes require strict size and weight regulations to be met for electric motors, and the leading factor in this is power density, or the power per unit mass. The end goal of this project is to maximize the power density for continuous motor operation with these advanced cooling techniques. On this end, we have a facility currently worked on by Maureen. This is the jet impingement slash pool boiling facility. This setup was designed for clear visualization of the test surfaces while allowing direct comparison between boiling with a forced convection jet and in a still pool. 
My experiments will be in the pool boiling configuration to examine how enhancements, particularly fins, impact boiling heat transfer rates. The experiments will compare the enhanced thin surfaces to a plane surface and determine where and why the boiling effects no longer follow the predictions of generic thin heat transfer equations. For this, the clear visibility given by this facility is imperative. The overall goal is to come to a better understanding of boiling on fins so that heat sinks can be optimized for various heat fluxes, potentially allowing wider use of passive phase change cooling in high power electric systems. Enjoy the rest of the tour. Here we come into the place where myself, Somo, is actually working on thermal management of electronic packages. For electronic packages which have very high heat loads, it's important to design very state-of-the-art solutions which can quickly adapt. Hence, we are designing novel heat spreaders which can be tested in the laboratory by the facility. You can see there is a cold plate and then there is a heater block there. The data is getting recorded in the acquisition system and final output in the computer which enables and informs the design process. I am Rishav and in this video, I will explain the setup that I use to study evaporation driven salt crystallization in a porous medium. Such a porous medium is mimicked by copper particles filled in a microchannel. I am studying the dynamics of salt crystallization as the salt solution enters the medium from below, travels to the top surface where it evaporates to the ambient and eventually salt crystallizes on the top. The microchannel is inserted into a rubber plug which is in turn inserted into a test tube filled with a solution of sodium chloride. The salt solution wicks into the particle column and evaporates from the top surface. The microchannel assembly along with the test tube is kept on a weighing balance to measure the evaporated mass loss. There are two cameras to observe the process, one from the top and one from the side. The salt concentration inside the column increases over time and salt starts crystallizing first at the top surface when the concentration reaches critical supersaturation. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And finally, we come into the last section, our colleague Anali, two is boiling in parallel microchannels. Depending on the test that you want to run, you could either have an isolated channel configuration like the one on your right, which has two identical copper blocks that once they are mounted into your test section, will be separated or isolated by an air gap. Then you can also have a thermally coupled configuration, like the one on your left. In this particular case, it is a single copper block that has the two channels machined into it. This is how the test section looks once it is actually connected to the facility. This isolated tube right here and over here, they work as the inlet and the outlet. The total pressure drop right here and here are then connected using transparent tubing to a pressure transducer, again in the facility. And of course, the channel pressure drop is also connected to pressure transducers. The last thing to talk about is the temperature measurements in the test section. What you see right here in this image is actually the thermocouples that are going through the peak and into the copper channels. We, are, uh, we take different measurements along the copper block so the copper block will be going from this region right here, probably until over here. So we are taking uh, different temperature measurements across the, the channels. We just had a tour through the electronic cooling laboratory, but we actually have many more facilities. The Botan Nanotechnology Center, where we can fabricate the nanostructures. We have the Flex Lab, we have the prototyping suits, where we can manufacture things and bring those things into this lab and also test them out. And this integration of multiple labs in the various departments is what makes Purdue great.